Okay, you ready guys? Yeah. Okay. Okay, good. Okay, hello. My name is Harry Bendy and today I'm going to talk about noting based perception perception conversion. I'm going to continue with the topic in regards to the whole course in a sense, in a way. So let's dive in. First I'm going to talk about some definitions that I have come up with by myself and uh, relate this to language, to brain network, to perception itself and to personal sensing of the world. Second, I'm going to talk about the noting that I'm doing a lot, mostly in private, not this like class thing, this is like a public one. The private one, which has a little bit more structure, a little bit more uh, systematic approach to this. And then I'm going to relate this to brains, at least how I see how it could work. And then I will provide you a motto for the day. So the first definition, CPM. It relates to, or it stands for consumer producer model. It comes from one of the uh, lecturers in this university, Lao Motus, in case you have heard, who has written a book about this. I haven't read it, but the concept that he delivered during his um, lectures, uh, during his uh, course, was pretty much the same that I have here. That you either, ha ha if you're like a living human being, you already have like two set of kind of roles in, in any situation. You're either consuming or producing. If you're consuming, you accumulate data, you're absorbing something from the world. If you're producing, you are changing the world, you're altering it, you're influencing it, you're broadcasting, whatever. And wh but what I mean by online and offline, it's not like uh, only in software that we are like consumer and producer or like you're reading news, but it's... I, I, I have a remark here. Since we are trying to compress this, just try to compress it to it. Otherwise, we <laughs> just keep the important parts. Or, all right. It's kind of um, summarizing on the slides. You could read as well, but uh, it, it's kind of obvious, I would say, right? And this is uh, related to the software, like a real world part, where this uh, model would be useful. And just uh, two examples uh, or ca cases where uh, you could relate to, or with that you could, you, you could relate to. Now the STO. This is a subject tester observer model, meaning that each person is operating by, internally or intrinsically, by either of these three roles and they are exclusive. So if you are, you are in a subject role, then you're not tester and vice versa, right? These are the general properties that I have defined them to have, kind of characteristic, characteristics. If you experience something in the world and you don't expect something, you, like in a flow state, so to speak, then you are the subject. But uh, if you have some kind of plans for the future, based on your experience, then you're a tester. You're generating tests like what could happen or what, or what if. And the feedback loop comes from the observer side, who is like the background third person perspective, who is neutralizing and who is uh, giving a different perspective o on the world. The subject might be a little bit too emotional. Observer is the rational one, at least in my case. And Observ observer side, at least okay, in my case, happens on the inside. That's what you don't see. The subject one, which is the emotional one, maybe even right now I'm walking back and forth here, I'm not very confident in the speech itself. So it's the subject uh, one uh, rolling, right? But when I get inside the topic and I start referring to myself as what mistakes I made maybe in like five minutes ago or 10 minutes ago, then it's the observer side actually kicking in. The tester side, I would say, was that I decided to attend the course in the first place, right? Like triggering the action or triggering or getting myself into conditions or scenarios by which I could learn from the world being in a subject role, assuming that my observer role is working on a background, even with the delay, meaning that uh, I have experience right now and I 
realize something a week later or maybe a, an hour later. So what is NAI? It's noting artificial intelligence, simply put. It's a machine that ideally would generate thoughts that are similar to the way I would do it, given that I have the trained it with my own notes. Get it? So I'm providing it data. It learns to be not me, but to think like me. And then when I have some thoughts in my mind, some fragments that I want to utter, I only have to write down some keywords and the machine is going to expand this according to the wording that I would use normally by myself and the style and the structure so that as the main goal in life, at least how I see it, is to save more time. Okay, following this far? Good. Still turn off, but I'm trying to understand. Okay. So the noting repetition basis would be an AI program, which would uh, just explain it a bit more what we would do. It would learn the syntax and structure I use in language to deliver meaning, given that I have provided enough layers of classificators and uh, core ideas, so that it would know in the future how my core ideas could be now expanded into like full notes into like no normal sentences. If I just like that, if you write then uh, few notes like short uh, phrases or words, yes, to expand them, right? Yes. Or explain them into longer sentences. Yes. Okay, okay, get it now. Yeah. So this like a quote generator, kind of. So, this type of AI it could be used, uh, you get a feedback, and then it just uh, madly quick scrambles through all the notes and then pull the notes out and make an answer based on that note? What do you mean by an answer? It's, like not, it's not a question it's thing. It's yeah, yeah, but if, it's, if the AI is queried about something, whichever, in whichever system it is working, then it will ponder through all these notes and then transform them into something that can be used as some sort of answer? Doesn't mean a word answer, or it can be like a system answer or something. Is that the point of the artificial intelligence? Are you talking about self-referencing? Yes. Yes, I would uh, get in close to, but that's what we refer to today, that uh, we want to get more informed knowledge of the world, like right, to get the as the lecturer put it, <laughs> why we attend it, like why semiotic people uh, want to get this big universe ideas is because you want to get to the edge of the global knowledge base. So you will be always working on the most updated version, assuming that you consume something, meaning that you are on the subject role at one point, right? Did you answer your question? Yeah. Okay. And the sec on the last definition is PPC, the whole idea behind this is perception, perception conversion. We had some examples on the board here about uh, converting from one, one language to other or removing just one part of the symbol, which changes its entire meaning. Now, perception, perception conversion should ideally resolve this, meaning that we are preserving the intention rather than just our observed memory of the object. Objects even abstract talks, like in math, for example, they can only serve, or they should only serve, as triggers. Also, we had this topic, or it was like mentioned in the past. And keeping people on the same page is the key. As a utilitarian, we have lots of communication problems, both time-wise and content-wise. If one person's perception could be altered into a format that the other one could perceive the best, that is, they would understand immediately what it is go what's going on, or they could learn the fastest, then we would have less conflicts that would emerge from communication, usually. It would be, do I understand right, that it would be like uh translating system which translates like any kind of everyday communication so I don't directly talk to you but I talk to the translating system which then converts my text into a better message for you which yeah. I personally wouldn't be able to do so well yeah okay so it's kind of like 
balancing it between excessive explanation and concise uh, summary. Okay, like a perfect or, or very good communicator. Yeah, like a mental diplomat, yeah, so to speak. Then a little bit technical part, what I do myself a lot is uh, noting. The first thing I want to refer to is the classificators. In the past, like since 2015, I uh, was using those longer classificators. Actually have more of them, maybe like 50 in total. But uh, in 2016, I guess, or even 17, I decided to use the short form and then using one letter from uh, English alphabet, kind of narrow it down, which would be the, like the first character on the line, then tab, time reference, and then if I want to combine more classificators, then I can add the longer ones. But the main one that the main thing I expect from the uh, note comes from the shorthand one. Kind of like the prioritized the classificators. And also on the bottom here, you see the importance part. Like usually it's a letter with exclamation mark just to find it easier from the text, just for filtering. But uh, I can also add like more of those marks which uh, refer to the importance. So if I want to like really, let's say I had like M with the three uh, exclamation marks, then I'm talking very deeply about myself, like my core, my heart or mind, whatever, spirit. Something, I realized something, uh, a stepping stone in my life, for example. Then in every note, I also have the inspired by part, which is technically personalized set of triggers for a certain thoughts. Meaning that if I observe something or I generate something in my mind, I have so-called train of thought going from one hop to another or one thought to another, then I am only going to write these hops so that in the future, if I read the note myself, if I, if I consume my own past production, I'm able to regenerate the mindset to have the same perception of that thought as I had in the back then, right? Kind of like, like a memory base. Oh, and in case you're wondering what's A meaning here, this is a short uh, form for assumption. So it's A colon, blah, 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 comma, another assumption, comma, another assumption, and, and ending with dot. The point here is to minimize the time that I have from having a train of, or have a thought from the train of thought and actually noting it down. That's the manual part, which is why I want to have the NAI so that I would talk to the machine, it would generate it for me. I don't have to actually write it or type it or speak about this because speech basically is still like text, right? It should be transcribed, but it's still manual. I want to like this, this as automated as possible so that uh, there would be less so-called corruption on the focusing on the grammar side, the technical side, are rather focusing on the abstraction itself. So I'm not uh, interrupting the mind itself. The third part of the noting, which is quite essential, is uh, tracking the train of thought. And this is uh, handled using internal references, such that when I have a thought, I make a tree structure, basically I have a main thought here, then somewhere in the middle I have a new thought. Right? I'm having a reference for this. I'm going to write it all down, formulate the thought, and then I'm going to continue with the so-called main branch. Right? The thought could also be at the end of the, uh, the so-called main branch thought, and I can go deeper from there as well. Assuming that I'm always formulating my thoughts. Branching is fully formulated, it means that uh, if I start the thought, I have to finish it. Otherwise, it would be pointless. If you don't finish it, let's say you wait for, I don't know, five minutes afterwards, you might already have forgotten it, in which case it takes you like three to five times more just to regenerate the mindset to get to the same thought. Or even worst case, something I have called NFL. It's not some kind of football stuff, it is noting fragment lost, meaning that uh, I admit to myself that I have not been able to keep my thoughts in my mind. 
unable to formulate fast enough. Maybe there was an interruption, like physical one. Maybe somebody made a phone call. Maybe like somebody messaged on, I don't know, on Slack or got some email, whatever, right? And the fourth thing, which also contributes to the perception, perception part, is the alternatives that I have in my notes. Meaning that the same key thought can be expressed in different excessive wording combinations. So that uh, if I have, yeah, okay, it is written on the board here. Basically, I'm going to show you some examples wh as well. Using one kind of wording with one syntax, maybe even a little bit different structure even within the sentence. And you can say it in a different form. Maybe one is like ultra rational, ultra observer guided, or like guiding. And the second is more like subject sided, like more emotional, something that is bet betting more on the sentiment rather than the rational thought. And there are two types for alternatives. The first is that it's external, so that I have like one note here, second note here, and the V in the in the middle. V as like for like or operation, right? And the internal one is um, with forward slash, meaning that just a small fragment within the note itself, the so-called main note, has different forms to say this. For example, if a leader was in a group and said that I'm giving you instructions, it might be like taken as a little bit too harsh, like too forceful. But when, when the leader said, I'm giving you visionary guidance, see? It's a little bit different. You are adding more sentiment, just changing some words, but the output on the consumer side is much different. Because now it's just not to believe you, but they are like, as you can see, smiling, right? You actually can use language and have the same meaning, but have, uh, sorry, you have the same intention, but you can reach it via different structural forms and syntactic forms. One could say that, well, the more, the more you read, the better you will get that at this rate. But I would argue against it and say that the more you write, the better you get at this. And also, as an answer to your question, if you only keep writing and you never read, just only with your observation, then you only, as you said, will remain limited within your own observation sphere, right? Then some examples, uh, I'm going to show them later. The future, what I expect this to roll into, or at where it could be useful, is to link this with brain network. Brain network doesn't exist yet, I know, but the main point is to put the language, cascade this into perception, perception conversion, and now map the entire thing using signals in the brain, meaning that you don't have to actually speak things out. But, but, but doesn't that assume that the brain stores information as if it was a try? As what? A try. A try. A try. A try. No, no, a try. It's a type of, a, it's like a binary story street basically, to store this. Ah, okay. Brain is not fixated, right? How I have realized how the memory works is that you have certain triggers from the environment and they create, they bring up only those memories which are related to what you perceive. Get it? So it's not like you always have this in maximum indexing of all the knowledge you have in your personal knowledge base. It's not like you know everything instantly. You ask me a question like from my notes on a 500 page, I don't know this, right? But, uh, or if you ask some kind of fact I probably knew like two years ago, but I have forgotten it because it doesn't, it's not relevant. But if I have the mindset for this, it's like, aha, I click, then the memory kind of emerges. It's like memory is like an emergent property. It's not fixated like in a tree structure. Yeah. It's more like you have like a holistic view, but uh, you're like kind of getting the tree structure out of the holism for a moment when you're perceiving something. Yeah, but it's a sense of like, it's not like, um, what do you think that it's not that it's not ordered, but it's just that it's not readily accessible to your investment? Yeah, yeah. Same thing, it's like, um, you're saying it's like an, an index system. Right. 
What? An indexing system. Yeah, but uh, not in a way that uh, you know every index in immediately. It's more like yeah, the. Yeah, it's not a complex indexing system. You could say. Yeah. I could argue here, but okay, let's let's move. Yeah, let's move on. The basic uh, idea is that how we perceive the environment is dependent on us as the agent, activity we're engaged in within time constraints. Well, time is just one constraint. You can have like spatial constraints or whatever. It's just uh, one kind of example. And every activity that we are engaged in have goals. I mean, that's what I ma make an assumption here. And goals are finite and they're measurable. If they're not, then they're not goals, simply said. And now, voila voila, the magical part, the formula. I know it doesn't really make much sense, maybe, but what it says is that ultimately, according to singularity, the global knowledge base withheld by AGI or artificial general intelligence is going to be updating itself and getting or gaining knowledge only from positive perceptions that people have within their personal knowledge base. Positive perception is this part. This is included within the PKB, which is filtered based on the noting AI. Well, yeah, that's like my way of doing it. Like I assume that it's going to be language first, at, at least to some degree, which is training itself on the agent. Following? So agent has ideas, formulates or notes them down, and AI is going to analyze it, not just removing this manual part, like to automate this noting, uh, a thought formulation process, but also creating a map of how the person thinks. From this can create structure for personal knowledge base, which holds, at least to some degree, some positive perception of the environment. I mean, it, theoretically, it could be zero, like there is no positive, like maybe someone is like suicidal or something. So in that case, that person's knowledge or understanding of the world does not propagate to AGI. If it did, then AGI would learn also what it means to be like, a, I don't know, killer or whatever. So it's, this idea tries to limit the possibility of machine causing harm to humankind. And you might say like, okay, what if this NAI, no, not everybody's writing text, right? Like it, it takes time, it's like, it takes effort. So how would you like, replace this NAI part? Well, we will have uh, talks about neurons, I guess, and mirror neurons, but uh, what if we had bots in the brain or at least some way to map the entire brain in real time such that we could map the perception of positivity with the signals and firing in the brain. Or even simpler, we have so-called ETSO chemicals, like uh, endorphins, dopamine, uh, oxytocin, and serotonin. So whenever you detect that there is any of those released, it means that you have a positive perception of the environment, right? Is At least, it, yeah. yeah. So if you can detect this, you can now record from on that moment the brain signals and based on now what you said, like we can record, you can have like a microphone always with you, right? This is going to create your understanding of, of the world, improving your personal knowledge base and also contributing to the general knowledge base. And when it comes to positive perception and science, for example, for the most part, scientists want good for mankind. Agreed? I mean, in case it was other ways around, it would be like dystopian Hitler-like future, I would say. By the way, every person actually has their own hero in their mind. So you could say that every person could see that their perception is positive. At least they, were like, they have their own benefits in this, right? But there has to be some kind of reference to what it means to be negative in the first place, like culturally accepted negativity, you would say, in case you didn't use the brain signals directly. And the brain signals can also be faulty in a way that uh, if somebody feels good when they're causing harm, then this brain signal, this uh, 
uh, not very signal, but the chemical reaction observation would uh, give wrong results. So there has to be some kind of reliability back to this, to back this up, right? And the last thing, my motivation for noting in general is just summarized in this small formula, which stands for <coughs> reflect to memorize, reflect to generalize, reflect to withstand, reflect to understand. Noting for life. You don't memorize such that you only like do it, like focus that I have to learn it by heart. Is you are just open-minded and you create references, which is what, what we call as experience. You generalize, you update your world model. You withstand if you have some negative thoughts or you feel bad, then writing usually helps you come out of this so-called cycle and understand to make sense of yourself in the world. Get it? OK, now we have gone through the so-called theoretical part. I'm going to show you a little bit of examples as well. Mm. Just some random, sorry, you didn't see this. My bad. You can see this, yeah. This is an example I also mailed you, I guess. I don't know if you have read this, but uh, it's technically what it is. I can go through at least one of them. Here, what I call it a chain is that I have a train of thought, but the nodes within that train are linked sequentially, but they're not fragments themselves, right? And then I have this double dash and an arrow and eventually I get to the actual quote, and so the actual note, which in this case is quo, which stands for quote and not uh, about noting. So it's quote about noting. And then I have the noting part. Then I have another note from this. I don't have to use necessarily this reference here because I'm doing it at the end of the note. I could use the reference if I wanted to, but uh, I chose not to because it's tailed anyways. This is personal. Ski means uh, or stands for science. Then I have another note, and then another trail from this, or another note, this BI, which is book idea, and personal, so it's like title for book, which refers to me to some, to some degree. Um, <laughs> of course. Well, sometime, I was like, um, last year I was very strict about this. I was writing approximately 100 kilobytes per week. So I was like very, very hard on my productivity. So in case I had some uh, interruptions or something, then I was like, okay, this is pausing part. And then I'm not working on this because I used session-based noting back then. Um, then I updated it because at, sum at summer, when I was at home, I was unable to always be behind computer. So I, I started to use paper again, but now in the paper I only added those small fragments. And uh, with fragments, there is a huge chance that you lose the thought. Like you formulate the key, right? But unless you expand it, as, and as unless you formulate this in a full note, in day or two it's going to be gone. You can't regenerate the mindset. With, because you didn't have the inspired by part, you didn't put it in the, like, the note. The fragment only serves va va value in the moment, unless you formulate this as a producer, you're going to forget it from experience. Then TBN also went into my computer, that is, I started to use it here as well, much shorter, and the structure is such that I enumerated them, added some kind of importance in the beginning. Classificators took even shorter, just like only two letters, right? This is uh, business tactics, this is science tactics, and personal tactics society. And the inspired by part was in parentheses at, at the end, right? Because how the mind works is, at least in my case, is that first it's a trigger that's inspired by a part, and then you follow with the note, right? The formulation captures the actual flow of how the thought progresses. 
But uh, here, I was more focusing on the core, the noting fragment itself. And then in the end, in a very short form, I added this inspired Pi part. Right? And as, as you can see, the whole process started 36, ending 43. So it's like just seven minutes. It's, like, it's doable. And by the way, when you do this, you also develop a habit for blind typing. So the productivity in terms of writing goes much higher, like to 6,000 characters per hour, sustained. sustained. Then, but that's actually the version I sent you because, yeah, we're 2018 right now. So uh, this is now a little bit modified in a sense that um, this is U notes standing for unstructured notes. I call them unstructured because they started off not as regulated and not as requirement driven as my regular notes, and yet they preserved the main elements of the notes themselves. Right? And that's where you can see the uh, shorthand classificators on the edges and the extended classificator, like here in the beginning, without inspired pi part. Here we have inspired pi part. Again, trying to bring in how the th thought actually progresses. Ending here. And then the fill means philosophy. Prof means profession. Berk means perception. Mm. There's something, the INTP, is it, is it about the <laughs> personality test? Yeah, yeah, uh. yeah. I have done it like four or five times, hoping to get different results. And because like, I don't really want to constrain myself to certain uh, models, because I see that, that I am also part of some other types. So I redid the test. And that's why I would say for recent two or three months, I have referred to this a lot. So you believe in it? To some degree. But I have also a theory about this called personality equilibrium, meaning that the more you experience in the world, you will acquire more of positive characteristics of other types. That is, you can work on your weaknesses much more. And tech enables this. OK? For example, INTP doesn't really uh, talk in social settings, right? I mean, by the model. But right now, I give here a presentation and actually talk to the camera a lot. So for me, talking is not the problem. It's more like how experienced I am in talking among other people in public, right? And it's all trainable. Oh, and one more thing, maybe you, like, what is the not? Why is it capitalized? I have a computer systems background, and uh, there in digital systems, we always write, at least in the Verilog, uh, those uh, operations with capital letters. And usually, not is also is all, not usually it's always present there. And if you don't emphasize this, then people usually perceive the word without the negation, right? I can't add like in a text like some of, you know, tilde here, and okay, it's negated, right? So I had to like, capitalize it. It's about not taking notes, like emphasize it. It's the not of the activity or of, of the verb. And then I also had um, some period for UTBN, which means that the TBN, which was like enumerated and uh, structured to some degree, went into UTBN, which is unstructured. And here I brought the inspired by Bart back in the front again. And the notes got a little bit longer, not just like four or five keywords, but more like a little bit extended. But they weren't necessarily accompanied with or by classificators. And as you can see, you can also have like additional notes within the uh, TBN itself. Enumer enumeration would uh, run into contra contradiction in this case. Like if I wanted to build an actual system that would analyze my notes, then I would have to be consistent within one of those structures, right? If I know how I have done it, I can just convert from one to another because I know how the elements are here. And I can provide more data because right now, most of the data is in regular notes. But I have like given it up since August 2017 because uh, I was 
I learned to live as well. So um, just writing, uh, not all day, but let's say three, four hours a day was a little bit um, too much sometimes. I was like conditioned to always be with this thing at least once 24 hours. And once mean four hour gap. Which in summer means that you can't go traveling, right? So it was uh, like even in nature but for a longer period. So it was a problematic part for me. And that's basically it from my side. Well, it's the most interesting lecture I've heard for a very long time. Really, really good. I can't say I, I, I can draw any immediate consequences, but thoughts start with slowly growing. Thank you. I know it's kind of late, but any other thoughts? Like what, what do you think about this? Not maybe the noting part, that's the personal stuff, but like the uh, global knowledge base, AGI, perception, perception, conversion, using language for this. Anything? It seems that the, the concept is, uh, the concept bases itself around uh, another concept that we have some kind of idea how the architecture of a uh, real brain or mind works, it seems. Yes. Which is why I think it might be like um, flawed in the future, in that sense. Because it's like trying to, it's like basing something so big on something that we have nothing but very superficial uh, knowledge of. Yes. Which is why I think like uh, it's like um, it is very like deep, but at the same moment it's uh, it feels like it's getting deep in a place that you don't know really how deep it is. Yeah. But we have to. Ask, I mean, not have to, but uh, it would be wise to start somewhere, right? Yeah. And that's why I said it's future stuff. Like brain is it's like a vision right now, maybe 40, 50 years. But it's like with what I have right now as a language, I, I can control this part. At least, at the very least, I can use this as the data in the future, right? Yeah. So I'm kind of like building it slowly. What did you not try to do? Do you know about IBM Watson? Yeah. Did you ever use it or anything? No. Like this? It like if you if you put all that stuff on Watson, there is a website from IBM called Bluemix. They has a bunch of services from Watson. You can try to do some of the stuff that you said on Watson already. So I'm providing my own notes, and it would learn me. Yes, it will learn you. It will also analyze the tone of your text, everything. Tone? Yeah. How can you have tone? I haven't read them out loud. Uh, actually, it won't, because he has his own set of regulations of creating notes. And Watson would normally just take a bunch of data. It has uh, a natural language processing system available, which is, again, based on some rules that Shweta discussed. But the point is, again, this is a completely new set of rules and regulations that he has. So he's trying to create his own natural language processing technique, I would say. Yeah. I would say that, I'm, again, I'm not next. You're right, because uh, I'm focusing more on how the thought is formulated, right? Otherwise, I wouldn't, what the heck? Other, otherwise I wouldn't have the inspired pie part. But I think it's nice because, like, Watson, he will give you, in that part, say, especially uh, that you said of your natural processing, language method that if you put it on Watson, even what you wrote about that, it's going to give you some kind of feedback on that. And by tone, I mean, if what you're writing on that, you are angry or you are maybe not very happy or something. So that can somehow assist. No, because see, I feel like it's very important. No, but because see, I feel like it's very important. that's the problem, right? See, the thing is, Watson is basically a decision support system. You could say it's a decision support system. So you give it all the recipes, it will create a new recipe, right? And you, you give it all the information of all the medical books, it will behave like a doctor. The point is, it's only re representing the knowledge that it has gained from all these sources. Here, it's not just about uh, representing the information. It's uh, actually about designing a system that could somehow mimic his behavior or the person's behavior who is adding the notes. So it's more, I mean, it has possible, like it, it possibly has more scope than Watson. Yes, Watson might be able to do that. And I think they also state this, that they're trying to achieve this idea of creating a complete AI. But I mean, it's still quite away from that right now. It's basically just a decision support system. 
It's basically just a group of experts who monitor what's being fed into the system, uh, a bunch of books or, or data that allows the machine to learn, and it has the semantics on the back end. So it basically gathers all these words, uses natural language processing to create these networks of words, and on the basis of the user's queries, tries to predict what the possible answers would be. Now experts check these answers and they reinforce that. That okay, in case you have such questions, this could be the Yeah, but answer. what I think of Watson with regards to this is not even the Watson itself, but it's just the clown computing part of Watson that I feel like uh, what you're trying to do, even though it's your own things, I feel like you would benefit a lot if you kind of could have some kind of constant processing of that thing. Right, right, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Because I feel like you, you have all, all of these, like a, a massive amount of nodes, but I feel like if you've been a process in one computer or something, or, you know, just like this, you could just feed that process so have, constantly. Have you, by the way, have you tried to do that, what, what you are saying? Uh, not yet. Because it's certainly something which could be done realistically to some yeah, you degree. Could, you could do this in like an afternoon, if you just put all, all of that thing in some kind of an Excel sheet. And you just run some basic machine learning algorithms, you can get something from that. Yeah. I, I'm not so yeah, optimistic about the machine learning part here. But uh, actually, these notes are like pretty short right now. The collection, I, I tried to target for 10 megabytes like, uh, characters. So uh, maybe that would be enough. And also, given the promises in few shot learning, in case you're aware of, the, I require less data. So maybe 10 megabytes would be enough, right? Usually in text, uh, like in the statistics, you require like tons of data, you need like gigabytes of data, like I, I don't have this. But probably it would be an incredibly interesting project to actually do exactly what you said, to take this stuff and start processing it and see how yeah. it can be, it's almost what you said, right? Mm -hmm. Let's start processing it. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you could create a system that somehow uses all the rules that he proposed and on the basis of the rules could analyze text, then there is a chance. I mean, if you have heard about Quora, this website, yeah, yeah. so I mean, I, I'm not sure, but they have said that they would be releasing all their data to public so that people could train their own machine learning systems to gain knowledge. So if you could design a system or a program a system that's based on your rules and regulations, and it somehow converts that context from Quora into your schema, uh, schematics or schema, then maybe you don't uh, need people to uh, provide knowledge to the system. It could simply harness the data from Quora and on the basis of your schemata could gain knowledge that the people from Quora have, I mean, theoretically. True, true, when it comes to knowledge, but uh, I also referred before about the intention and perception, mm, right? I, I so, uh, if somebody writes like a huge sentence, what are the keywords that they want to stress out? You know, what is the thing that I, as a consumer, actually filter, right? That, that's, the, that's the difference. Like, I know what is noting fragment here, not for maybe every note, because sometimes it's like kind of hidden in a sense, that, that's the kind of beauty or art of language. But uh, when I read someone else's text, yes, I get the idea and the point, but I don't, have the, I don't necessarily have the experience behind it, right? I don't know what they actually mean by this. If somebody says, I had to work like 10 hours in McDonald's for five days a week, I'm like, yeah, your problem didn't get university degree, right? Your, it's uh, your own fault. But if I actually were there, flipping burgers or whatever, I would like maybe feel sorry for him, right? I would take it uh, differently. That's why no, this... Guys, I have to say, I have to protect you from starting to boil your own brains. Mm -hmm. and I have to <laughs> this was me, Harry a student in computer systems in Tallinn University of Technology, Estonia. You just watched a recording from analytical philosophy class and the topic was about noting artificial intelligence and perception-perception conversion and ultimately the future of brain network. And as always, as from my side, Thank you for listening, thank you for watching, bye.